after submitting the topic for your rhetorical analysis, I wanted to go over some of the things that you need to address before you begin drafting your paper. First of all, make sure that your summary meets the guidelines in the Hacker and Summer text. Um, notice over here on the right where it discusses what the summary is. First of all, in order for a writer to determine if a text is effective, the writer first has to identify the main point of the argument. So that's particularly important. So let's look at specifically what that's supposed to include, and you need to judge yours and determine if that's the case using the feedback that I have provided. First of all, the first sentence includes the name of the author, the title of the text, and the thesis of the argument. What is the point of the argument? What position has that author taken in that particular text? Then you include the key points of support that the author uses uh, for that argument. If you have chosen an advertisement and you have an image, you may want to begin by describing the advertisement. Uh, explain specifically what is in it. Think about if you were trying to tell someone what it looked like and they had not seen it. And then write what is, in effect, the thesis. So what is the idea being communicated with the image? What is the argument that the image makes? So if you are analyzing an image, your first sentence needs to include the name of the advertiser, the title of the product, the title of the advertisement or the product or uh, public service that is being addressed, and the thesis of the argument. What is it that the advertisement is trying to convince the reader or the viewer to do or believe? So that's our first step. So if you need to make modifications there, make those modifications. The second thing is that you have to define terms. And I want you to look back here, over here on the left to why definition is important after we talk about what you need to include. You need to, in, you need to define your terms so that the reader knows what you're judging against. So if I say that the reader uses ethos effectively, excuse me, that the writer uses ethos effectively, what is ethos? What do I mean by that terminology? And then when I show them the examples from the text, I can show whether or not that is effective or not. So I need to tell what the term is, what does it do, and how does it do it. So for instance, if you have an image, imagery is a device that uses sensory images to evoke a response. Visual imagery, which you have in a print advertisement, is a device that uses drawings, photographs, or graphics to evoke a response. So if I define what imagery is, then I can discuss how that specific text or photograph uses imagery effectively. Now I want you to look back over here to why definition is important. Think in terms of saying one thing is better than another, that an Apple's better than a PC, that a Galaxy's better than an iPhone, that LeBron James is better than Kobe Bryant, that a Toyota is better than a Honda. But based on what? So you have to define the term. So what makes a computer good? Or what makes a phone good? What makes a basketball player good or a car good? Then, based on that terminology, those terms, we can evaluate. So if I say that a basketball player is good if they score a lot of points, which one's better? If I say a basketball player is good because they contribute to the team and they contribute to the score of the game, do I have a different, better player? The point is, you have to define your term first in order to then judge. So if you have not defined your terms, you may have identified them, but you have to specifically define them. If you look here, you can look in Chapter 8 of your textbook for definitions, and I'll show that to you in just a second. But if you look then next, the citation uses a hanging indent. It is double-spaced and the hacker text tells you how to specifically format that. You can look in 
If you're using the textbook for definitions, you cite the textbook. You have a bibliographical citation for the whole textbook, but then you have a bibliographical citation for the text that you are analyzing, if that's what you've chosen. And then finally, if it's an advertisement, you, uh, you would cite the advertisement. Beginning on page 147 in Writing Today, there are definitions. They begin discussing. Notice that it tells you what it appeals to here. But then it actually defines it. Let's look at the next page. At the top of this page, it explains what ethos is. I mean, excuse me, what logos is. It defines it for us. You can use this as your definition. If you want to use a definition from someplace else, you certainly may. Just credit your source. The textbook defines ethos for us. Notice that it also gives us examples of how that may appear in a text. It defines ethos for us and gives us examples of how that may appear in a text. It defines pathos for us and explains to us the specific ways that pathos appeals to us. So we need to first provide definitions for our terms before we can analyze our text. Now this is the point that everyone should have come to. You have a summary, definitions, a bibliographical citation. Now the next step is making sure that you have actually identified examples of each appeal. You remember your textbook tells you what those examples may look like. This is what logos may look like. This is what ethos may look like. If I look at the next page, this is what pathos may look like in my text. So you need to actually identify specific examples and you need to be able to explain, and this is part of your analysis, how that illustrates the particular appeal or fits the definition and then you have to explain how that example is effective or ineffective in supporting the point of the thesis. And then you're going to draft the thesis of your analysis. Notice what your thesis looks like. Uh, in your textbook, there are example, there's an example on page 151. Let's look at that. Notice here they give you an example. Here I'm telling you sort of the formula, the text, which is the title of your article or the title of your advertisement, uses what devices or appeals. At a minimum, you should have ethos, pathos, and logos. Is the text effective or ineffective? And what is the text arguing? You need to identify the thesis of the text being analyzed. So, this text uses these devices to effectively argue that, and what is the argument? Now, if you think they're ineffective, text uses, as in uh, lives not worth the money, Text uses the, this particular text uses these devices, but ineffectively argues because. Why is the argument ineffective? Are the, you can, however, address how a text uses some appeals effectively, but then is ineffective because of its limitations. Now, I'm recommending that when you draft your paper, you use this format on the right, just because it's a little more clear-cut and easier to follow for the writer and often for the reader. So look at what it suggests. You have an introduction that identifies the subject of your analysis and offers background information, historical context, so you can provide context into, sorry, you can provide context. What surrounds this topic? Why is it being discussed? What's the background on it or the history? So that's what you do first. Get your reader's attention, provide background. It may be social context, economic context, political or intellectual.
It may be the history of the topic so that you can go back, specifically with the skateboarding topic. This is where you would provide your context. Then you have the thesis. We've already discussed what is included in that. You're arguing using these particular terms by which you are judging the text, that the text is effective or ineffective, in arguing the point that they say is their thesis. And then your body paragraphs address the use of one of the appeals. You explain the rhetorical concept, provide a definition, and then you give examples from the text and show whether or not they are effective. So the topic sentence says that the author or the text, the advertisement or the author's name, uses the appeal or the term to support the position that. Then define the appeal or the rhetorical device. You can use one of these two sort of devices to help you organize, but they do basically the same thing. Pi is point, illustration, explanation, quote. Sandwich is described as providing context, uh, a quotation, and then an explanation. So let's look at what both of those do. The point is the idea presented in the topic sentence of the paragraph that the author uses this, this particular device, effectively or ineffectively, to support the argument. Then you need an example from the text that illustrates the point you're making. Make sure you introduce it appropriately, which can also serve to provide context, that you punctuate it and cite it, and then you must explain how or why the example is that type of appeal and whether or not it is effective. In the quote sandwich, what is the relationship between the appeal and the quotation that's being used? This is effective. This is an example because. What is the example itself? And then explain how it contributes to the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the argument. How or why does the example that you've provided help to convince or fail to convince the reader? So you have three of those. Think in terms of giving at least a couple of examples. What's your main idea? The author uses this particular concept. Do they use it effectively or ineffectively? Here's an example. How does that example to contribute? Think about giving them two pieces of pie. And then your conclusion returns to the idea of the thesis. Is it effective? Why or why not? You can address why the argument has value, but you are not agreeing or disagreeing. You are only addressing the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness. You may look at where this argument goes in the future, but again, you're not agreeing or disagreeing. You're simply evaluating, evaluating the effectiveness of the text to argue the point. Now, as for the work cited, when you come to the end of your paper, you've written it, you're ready to put your citations, you can copy and paste them in, but if you would use the insert, and let me move it over, page break function, it starts a new page. And if you have a header that has been inserted, a page number over on the right-hand side, and you put your last name in, and then it will automatically number your paper. Now, the work title Work Cited is supposed to be centered, so I want to center it. And then I want to make sure and this is an issue for some people, so pay attention. So you've centered it. When you go to paragraph formatting, make sure that you have zero space. Make sure that your line spacing is at double. And then in order to have the hanging indent, you set that here. Say OK, and then your indent should be in place. So now when I type, 
it doesn't work. So now when I type, it automatically indents. And if I have a second, when I type, it automatically indents the second line. Continues to be double spaced. Still part of the same document. You use the insert page break, insert page break function. When you are setting your paragraph formatting, in paragraphing, make sure your spacing before and after is at zero and that it's a hanging indent and double spaced. So these were the things I was looking for in your assignment. Did you identify your topic? Did you identify whether or not you thought it was effective or ineffective? Did you provide a summary of the text? And did you provide definitions of those, of those terms that you were going to use to analyze the text? And finally, did you provide a citation that uses the formatting recommendations for MLA? You can find those in the Hacker and Summer text. Summer's text in the section titled MLA 4B.